Welcome everyone to our webinar um, and we're going to get started here. The California Consumer Privacy Act, understand your exposure and address your risks. And before I hand it off to our presenters, I do want to go over some housekeeping items. Um, so you can maximize or minimize the webinar pane during the presentation by using the red and orange arrow buttons. During the webinar, we also encourage you to ask questions. Our presenters are going to be answering those throughout the webinar as well as at the end as they have time. And if they run out of time, they will be contacting you um, to follow up. And then I definitely want to make sure that everyone has good audio. So if you're using your telephone, please select the phone call audio option. And if you're listening through your computer, uh, make sure you're selecting the computer audio option. So now I'd like to just go over some quick things about California CPE. So make sure you're using your own personal computer and you're logged in with your own personal um, information and unique URL. Be logged into our online software for at least 50 consecutive minutes within the scheduled time frame and actively respond to at least 75% of the polling questions. Today we're going to have four polling questions, so make sure you answer at least three. Um, also make sure you complete the evaluation survey at the end. And just as a note, as a participant, you will receive a link um, <clears throat> to download the slide deck and recording um, within 72 hours of the presentation. And today you're going to be assessing whether GDPR and or the California Consumer Act applies to your business. <coughs> Gain insight into the data subjects rights for GDPR and the California Consumer Privacy Act. Discover the impact of non-compliance and learn steps to implement new standards in your organization. So now I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to our presenters and we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you. Um, hey everyone, my name is Liam Collins. I am a partner here at Armanino. I run our risk assurance advisory practice. And one of our larger practice areas within that group is our privacy group, where we do help clients a lot with GDPR work, and now starting to work with a number of clients around AB 375 and helping them plan for that impact. And so today I have the distinct pleasure of introducing my colleagues who lead that privacy practice and who put a lot of work into we try to disseminate from that act where the relevance is for you guys as our clients and potential clients and how it's going to impact you guys with respect to really implementing it in a measured way. So. I'll start by introducing Fernando. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Fernando Andile. I'm a director for the Risk Assurance and Advisory Team under Liam Collins. A pleasure uh, for you guys, a pleasure for us to having you guys join us in this webinar. Hey, everybody. This is Noah Buxton, uh, again, a director in our Risk Assurance and Advisory practice. Uh, I work day to day in SOC, IT, controls assurance work. I also lead our privacy practice here. And I've worked with dozens of clients already on uh, GDPR assessment, controls implementation, um, and actually working with clients on even compliance reporting now as well. Um, and so really looking forward to uh, additional work in, in California privacy law as well in this uh, new landscape. Right, and I am Heather Batzel. I am the founder and managing attorney with my own firm now, Batzel Law PLLC which is actually five years old this week. Um, and I have about 15 years of corporate and securities experience working with companies uh, in their full life cycle. And in my own law firm, I spend quite a bit of time as outside general counsel working with companies uh, launching and growing their businesses and helping them to figure out what regulations apply to them as one uh, big component of my work. Um, so that's how I fit in. Happy birthday to your firm, Heather. That's awesome. And <laughs> Thanks, Helen. <laughs> for everybody on the call, Heather um, and my team work closely together. When we're talking about privacy, we're talking about the overlap and the intersection of many different areas uh, and 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 law, security, data privacy. Um, really, there's a big overlap. So we, we lean on Heather, and she's a, an amazing resource. All right, so today, uh, as Mary mentioned, we have a number of topics we want to cover. Really, we want to give you an overview of the privacy landscape as it stands today. Uh, we want to, to start at a high level and give you an understanding of pri general privacy principles. Uh, what are the sources um, and the underpinnings of privacy regulation and law? We want to give you a, an overview of the general data protection regulation, as well as new California Assembly Bill, or AB 375, which is the California Consumer Privacy Act of 2018, just passed in June. So. Um, we'd also like to uh, touch on data protection and privacy best practices. And I would say overall here, we'll get into the requirements and details and distinctions between maybe GDPR and, and the California Consumer Privacy Act. Uh, but we'd also, really the goal here is to give you a working knowledge, uh, uh, you know, a clear understanding of 
the, the overall requirements of each of these regulations or laws, how they may apply to your organization, and, and really just kind of give you the ammo, I guess, to you know, have knowledgeable, uh, meaningful conversations with your customers and clients about what your organization is doing in these important areas. Um, and then just some housekeeping items. Again, we encourage you to ask questions. I'd love to answer them as we go and also take them up after the fact. Uh, let us be a resource to you in that regard. Uh, also, we're taking on two huge topics, so we're going to dive right in. Uh, we could spend one day on each of these topics, and so what I decided to do was pull a lot of the GDPR information uh, and the detailed requirements and push them to the end so you all will have access um, to this, to, to more detailed information in an appendix if you choose to, to reference it. We think it'll be a really valuable resource for you um, because it really is the full uh, landscape of requirements uh, for GDPR. All right, so with that, we'll dive in. So I will kick things off being the lawyer on the call with a quick disclaimer. Uh, just to say that none of my statements in this presentation are intended to be or should be construed as or relied upon as legal advice. It's just meant to be general information, as Noah said, to kind of uh, lay the foundation, set some context for understanding the conversations and the things that you should be looking into um, from, uh, from this point forward if you're not already. Um, and I'm not licensed in California, so I'm certainly not rendering California legal advice, even though we'll be talking about California in great detail today or some detail, I should say. <laughs> um, like Noah said, um, just understanding the, the context as a launch point for um, what you need to be doing and why is what we're trying to share. Um, and I think that thinking in about things both with respect to um, what is the landscape as well as how likely is this to apply to me? How how and when do I find myself in a situation where these things apply to me is a great way to just get the the juices flowing in your brain and think thinking about um, what you need to be concerned with. Um, so it's not that hard to trigger the data protection and privacy requirements that exist in different jurisdictions in different places, whether in the United States or abroad, such as in the European Union. Um, as we all know in today's business environment, businesses that were once Local shops can have international reach, sometimes even unintentionally. Uh, global business and commerce is, is easier than ever with the internet, and most companies have websites, and those can be reached uh, you know, generally from anywhere in the world. Um, and if you think about practices like logging and tracking web traffic, or even just capturing email addresses when people come to your website um, and share that for a newsletter, these are commonplace practices, and those are the types of things that are regulated. Um, and now, as we have uh, what are viewed as robust, uh, growing in scope um, and requirements laws uh, in the in the European Union with their new uh, enhanced GDPR, as well as recently this summer with California's new bill, which hasn't entered into law yet, but um, you know, has, has garnered a lot of attention and is expected to enter into force in some form um, in 2020, um, it's easier than ever to not only trigger the requirements, but also to have more onerous and rigorous requirements than perhaps uh, existed even uh, half a year ago. And it's important to, to note that um, when you're thinking about um, whether or not you're triggering requirements, the regulators typically care about whether or not it's their residents are the subject of your data collection or your other activity, not where you are. So that's how it becomes, um, you know, very quickly in your backyard, even if otherwise it seems like it wouldn't be. Um, so I'll give a, a brief overview of uh, the landscape of, of legal frameworks that apply or might apply to a given company and jurisdiction. Um, in the United States, we have we do have privacy and data protection laws, but they're not um, as sweeping and so haven't gotten the same type of attention as the European Union's uh, very developed data and privacy laws that have actually been around for, I think, about 20 years. It's just the most recent um, rollout that went into effect this past May 25th. So the United States has a different um, approach to privacy and data protection laws 
um, and it's not centralized and uniform, but it's called a sectoral approach. And it's, it's basically comprised of an amalgamation of uh, some federal laws that are more targeted in certain niche areas, uh, some state laws, in fact, I think every state has some form of uh, data protection and or privacy law. Um, and then they're also regulating bodies and self-certifications. So given that decentralized approach, it's, it's not comprehensive. Um, we have the Federal Trade Commission at the national level that, um, that business privacy issues falls most under but it's not their mandate to uh, particularly, uh, as of yet, to develop and enforce um, privacy laws per se. Their mandate is to go after unfair and deceptive trade practices. And so at times, incidentally, perhaps, it ends up uh, enforcing data protection issues, for example. Um, there's a program uh, that the Department of Commerce put together a couple years ago to facilitate the sharing of data between U.S. companies and EU companies in a way that would be compliant with their the EU's more onerous data protection uh, regulations, and so it was a self-certification compliance program. Um, the FTC would come in, for example, to enforce uh, a, a a practice that a company where in which a company is um, saying that they're compliant with this program. And reporting that and uh, to the to the uh, to their clients and customers, but not actually uh, having adhered to the certification requirements or even having defrauded. So that's an example of where the FTC maybe comes in and enforces, but it's not fundamentally because they're enforcing privacy or data protection laws, but rather they're enforcing uh, the uh, the deceit and unfair trade practices. Um, and then. Uh, there are other targeted areas where we have uh, protection, for example, with health uh, information or with children's personal data. So that's what we have really at the federal level. And then we have um, you know, a diverse set, as diverse as we have uh, as many states, a uh, set of, of state-based laws. And those state-based laws have actually tons of different uh, subcategories of privacy and data protection areas um, and some are more rigorous or less, some you know, cover just a few, some cover dozens of areas, and those um, run the gamut, as you would expect, because this is a diverse uh, set of states uh, tackling the issues that they think make sense to do that. And then um, notably, and as we'll dive into a bit more later in this presentation, we have California's newly passed bill, which is viewed as very robust and most akin to the EU's rigorous standards. <clears throat> And so that's an important part of the legal landscape going forward because um, lots of business and activity and residents um, are, are in California. Obviously, we all know California is a huge um, economic powerhouse in the United States and in the world. Um, and then a couple of other points I wanna to touch on when we talk about the, the um, legal framework, um, certainly a big area in the legal landscape in the United States is contractual law um, in the private sphere where a company um, enters into an agreement, whether with its customers and consumers, clients, or business to business, those contracts, once entering into a force and being binding, are part of the legal framework that governs. And, um, and you know, oftentimes in those uh, agreements, and I'll talk a little bit more about the agreements in a couple slides, but there are, uh, there's quite a bit that has to do with how we're treating sensitive proprietary information and data. And um, aside from very specific contracts that maybe are easy to call to mind, we also, of course, have things like website agreements that are privacy policies, terms of service, terms of use, et cetera, that are, are typically set up to be contractually binding. And um, similar to what I said earlier about the FTC uh, enforcing um, laws that maybe are not ones that they initially um, put out there, uh, but supporting the enforcement of them nonetheless, uh, where you have contracts that uh, where that are being breached and might rise to the level of a deceptive or unfair trade practice, the FTC and state courts might um, be the place where those are enforced. And finally, one other point I want to talk about um, with regard to the um, 
landscape is uh, that a couple weeks ago, earlier this month, the FTC actually announced that it's seeking comments on privacy as well as other related topics, um, and they're planning hearings uh, on the topic of competition and consumer protection in the 21st century, uh, and those hearings will be going on from September through January. So it'll be really interesting to see what the FTC has in mind uh, and what information they receive and how they uh, manifest that information, given some of the trends we're seeing in the EU and California. All right, and that's why we invited Heather. Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I would just say to capstone this slide, I think of this when I approach a client assessment or, or a conversation, I think of it as a tiered pyramid or sort of the layered cake, right? You've got, let's top, start at the top, international and national things that may apply, regulations that may apply, the state level requirements. What have I committed to my customers to do? What have I committed to my end users to do? Uh, and then internally, what's my governance structure and how am I going to effectuate controls uh, and you know governance again to to meet those requirements. So great. Similarly, keeping at a high level here and and under understanding the underpinnings of any privacy requirements, I think again this gives you the understanding and the ammo to feel confident and comfortable in conversations when privacy comes up. Uh, inevitably, you are probably already answering, depending on the role you play at your organization, you're, you're probably answering questions from prospective partners, current partners, vendors, uh, you know, customers. And uh, so really, when, if we're talking about uh, whether it's the, the new California AB 375 or we're talking about um, internal governance frameworks uh, for privacy or we're talking about privacy uh, policies and the, the practices and uh, that underpin them. Really, everything boils down to, to these points here, which is uh, these essentially reflect the data life cycle. How do we give notice and communication about um, our privacy uh, practices to end users and to partners? Uh, what mechanisms of consent uh, do we use, if any? Um, how do we collect the information? How do we actually go about collecting end user data or um, uh, other personally identifiable information, for instance, uh, is that necessary to the service or the product that we're offering, or are we collecting additional data? Uh, how does the organization use and retain and dispose of, of data? And then access, both internal and external, how are we giving transparency uh, to uh, end users, partners around the data that we do hold? And how are we protecting access to that data from an internal perspective as well? What uh, if disclosures are made, essentially sharing private information with third parties, um, how are those disclosures made and when, um, and what notifications might be made to uh, the actual data subject um, or the, the, the person uh, who that uh, information relates to? What, how are they notified? How do we maintain data quality? What practices and procedures do we put around data quality to ensure we have good data in our organization? And then how do we monitor and enforce um, governance programs? These are uniform essentially across all privacy frameworks, GDPR, AB 375, and whatever's coming down the pike. These are your, these are your sort of core principles. Awesome, so we're gonna have you guys answer our first polling question. We wanna get an idea of who's here. Um, so maybe you're here because you know the California Consumer Privacy Act and how it applies to your organization. B, you understand the European Union's GDPR how that implies to your organization, or maybe you know both, or D, maybe you aren't sure about either and you're here to learn more. So go ahead and let us know, um, and we'll give you about 30 seconds to finish that up. Okay, and we're gonna go ahead and close the polling in three, two, one. Let's see what your answers were. There we go. Looks like most people know about both and how it applies. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, everybody's got privacy on the mind. Great. So it sounds like we're speaking to uh, we'll be speaking to some important points that are hopefully useful. So there's been a lot of talk about GDPR. Hopefully most of you are well versed in it already, but we're going to talk about it a little bit. Go back. Yep. Okay. Uh, 
the purpose of uh, the EU's general data protection regulation was to move privacy law in the EU forward, uh, as well as to harmonize all of the uh, the patchwork of requirements that essentially uh, was enacted due to the prior law, which is uh, 20 years old essentially, which was the EU Data Protection Directive. And that directed member states to, to create privacy law in their jurisdiction consistent with the directive. And that ended up over many years being a diverse patchwork of privacy requirements that were um, hard, to apply, uh, hard to comply with for EU and international organizations, um, as well as uh, you know, enforcement from many different data protection authorities. So this is a harmonization in some, it, while GDPR is onerous, I think it also uh, streamlines um, or at least unifies privacy requirements for organizations. So in some ways makes things harder, in some ways makes things a little bit easier. Uh, the GDPR is um, cuts a wide swath. It, it, it applies to personal data, which is really any inf information uh, combined with another piece of information that can be uh, used to identify an actual person. Its territorial scope, again, is a wide swath. Every, I think most of us on the webinar know, but uh, it, it applies to controllers and processors, whether operating in the union or not, so long as uh, that inf the information uh, that's collected is of an EU citizen and in relation to the offering of a good or service um, or the monitoring of their behavior. So a number of different industries pulled in um, into the law. So uh, I'm going to give a little more uh, information as to how and when legal agreements, legal counsel, et cetera, come into play. Um, something that really strikes me when we're just doing such a, you know, there's so much focus on privacy and data protection these days, as we've been discussing, is that, you know, these types of topics are not brand new. Um, it's just that the the personal data is is getting a lot more um, emphasis and attention and uh, protection. And uh, but these types of topics, uh, such as how are we dealing with sensitive and proprietary information, you know, in in business, um, who does it belong to? How can it be used? With whom can it be shared? Who's responsible for protecting it? And how securely must it be kept? When must it be returned or destroyed are very um, common refrains uh, in agreements that I deal with all the time. And I, I bet a lot of people on the uh, webinar today do as well. It's interesting because the scope of those uh, considerations is becoming broader and more applicable and, and the rigor that's applied and the requirements are becoming uh, more expanded um, as compared to, for example, where I spent a lot of my time, you know, in business, uh, working with businesses to uh, to negotiate fiercely to be able to have their their data or their confidential information treated a certain way, or to be able to take and commercialize uh, data that's coming out of uh, of an initiative um, for themselves as compared to the the counterparty. So it's interesting that um, these topics aren't. Um, particularly new and so you have things like master services agreements consult consulting agreements independent contractor agreements those are really all the same thing uh, to some extent so those types of services agreements um, you have uh, pr privacy related agreements whether that's an NDA or confidentiality or those website agreements and privacy policies we're talking about before um, as well as agreements like data protection agreements and addenda um, that are uh, have have been heavily negotiated for a long time to some extent, but now there are going to be other components to be looking after. Um, something that uh, strikes me is is that um, up until recently, when I and other uh, attorneys and business people are drafting privacy policies for websites, for example, um, the philosophy has really been you can do whatever you want as long as you disclose it. And that I I don't I don't know that that that's not going to pass muster. Um, depending on which jurisdictions you're you're triggering um, applicability at this point. So, you know, if you're in the G GDPR with GDPR data subjects, EU data subjects uh, and or California, depending on how that law turns out, 
uh, that's not going to be sufficient to have somewhere buried on your website something that says we can do whatever we want with your personal data and we can sell it and um, and you can't do anything about it once you've uh, shared that with us. That that is not going to be the standard in all places going forward. Um, and you know, I, I enjoy my practice where I get to spend a lot of time crafting deals and contracts with this goal of everybody being happy, <clears throat> because that's typically what deals are. You're trying to get to a spot where uh, people are happy with the outcome and everybody's getting something. Of course, there's the other side of things where there's been a breach of covered. Uh, sensitive material or personally identifiable information um, that has to be addressed. And that's another area where there are certainly legal requirements to be uh, uh, reviewed and carefully um, complied with. And then, of course, lawyers uh, come into the picture um, when there's enforcement actions. Hopefully, um, enforcement actions won't be something that people are dealing with on the call. Awesome. All right, we'll, we'll move back to focusing on GDPR for just a moment. Again, pretty high level here, but these are the data subject rights that are related or uh, enshrined in the GDPR. Uh, while I won't read them to you, I will tell you that this is the hallmark of the GDPR. Uh, this is what everybody knows is that right to erasure. That was kind of the headline, I would say. Um, and I think the, the context or the understanding that we want to give here is that this is a the EU has a fundamentally different approach to privacy uh, because of the way it's really developed and been enshrined in law for, for many, many years. Um, the, the original EU European Convention on Human Rights actually granted privacy as a fundamental human right. So placing it essentially as high as it gets on our scale of, of rights. Um, and, and from that has trickled down again over decades, um, privacy laws, um, that really um, put data subject rights um, ahead, uh, ahead, or at least in strong competition with uh, with with organizations' rights to use and disseminate their data. And so, this is fundamentally different than the U.S. approach to privacy, which really um, has has placed you know organizations' interest in the use of data um, ahead of um, ahead of individual privacy rights. And I think that's that's a sea change that's happening right now. So you're seeing uh, you know, California's Consumer Privacy Act being referred to as GDPR for California or for the US. Um, it, it is in some ways, it's GDPR light for sure. Um, and I'll say that because the rights that you see here for GDPR as compared to the individual rights uh, enshrined in the California Consumer Privacy Act are uh, these, there are many more here. There is a right to access and right to erasure, which we'll get into, but uh, not these other rights necessarily. And so, uh, so with that, let's let's now kind of turn our focus. We'll look at uh, the California Consumer Privacy Act and get into some of the details there. Thanks, Noah. So now let's take a look at the California Privacy Law, uh, also known as Assembly Bill 375, and what it is. As you all know, uh, the bill was passed into law by Governor Brown on 6-28-18. That's basically just a few months back. This is a fairly new law. Uh, the bill, as mentioned by my colleagues, is akin to the European's GDPR, uh, which had an implementation date of 5 18 And uh, as you know, we will discuss more about GDPR in our later slides. The bill overall have a very good intention in protecting the California consumer privacy rights. In fact, our assembly member, Ed Chow, who leads the California Assembly Private Committee, called this a historic step, giving consumers control over their personal data, which is enforced through the loss provisions, which, which we will discuss later. Um, the proponent of the bill is Alistair McTaggart. Um, he, he described this as the strictest privacy bill in the history of the country, and that's rightfully so. The reason being is that Personal information under the scope of the California law doesn't just cover your standard personal information. This covers household and devices information. As we all know, um, devices with the advent of new technology, the Internet of Things, that will call, that casts a very big wide net of scope for personal information. Um, further, it is uh, reasonable to state that one of the impetus for the law being passed is this increasing number of data breaches in 2018, including the infamous Cambridge Analytica, as we all know, that ha harvested 87 million Facebook users' personal information. 
in the next slide. So who must comply? So this has always been a great question that for a new law. You want to understand and see if your business is actually a corporate entity, right? So in this case, um, if you are a for-profit business and you do business in California and you collect personal data from California residents and you exceed or meet one of these three requirements, you're covered. You have to comply with the law. The first one is basically have 25 million or more of annual revenue or you process or possess personal data of 50,000 California residents annually or you have 50% of your revenue coming from the sales of personal information. And I wanted to highlight about the fact of um, California resident. What is a California resident? You're a California resident if you are in the state. Basically, you're, you're, you're not here temporarily. You're staying in California. And you're a California resident if your intent is to stay here in California. Next slide, please. Awesome. So we're going to go ahead and get started with our second polling question. And it's both the laws, the GDPR and the Consumer Privacy Act can apply to the organizations outside of the European Union and California respectively. So is that true or false or not sure? I want to give you guys a few moments to answer that. Okay, and we're gonna go ahead and close the polls in three, two, one. Okay, so most people said it was true. Indeed, correct. Awesome. <laughs> Good. All right, we're glad so, you guys are listening. We appreciate that. Yep. Go Definitely. So just to continue, so what are the California consumer rights? Um, as my colleagues mentioned earlier, it's, it's akin to GDPR, so some of this uh, rights, you will be able to see them in the GDPR, but let's deep dive into each one of these. The rights to access. Um, consumers, California consumers, have the ability to request the record of what type of data that's being held by the organization and what's being done with my data, right, with, with the data. Um, the business, uh, the second step for the second consumer right is more, more so on the verification process. So if a customer or a consumer requests for information, the business, uh, let's say uh, a corporate entity, should have a mechanism in order to validate that the person or consumer requesting for that information is indeed that person. So either you uh, have uh, some authentication mechanism like a two-factor authentication, username and password or so, that you can leverage to make sure that the person requesting for information is indeed that person. Um, consumer rights to erasure, uh, this is similar to GDPR, basically delete my data. And that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a request that a consumer can, can do to a corporate entity. Um, disclosure and opt-in. So for the disclosure, organizations will have to disclose who the, whom did, to whom did they sell the data and com consumers will have the ability to object to the sale of that data. Um, basically opting out. Uh, in fact, um, uh, the, the businesses or covered entity should not have, should have a, a note or something in their website that says, that allows uh, a consumer uh, to opt out by having a note that says, do not sell my personal information. Um, and then the last part is anti-discrimination. So this basically, this covers the consumer who decided to opt out. Uh, for example, if I called my, um, my mobile provider and they said, do not share my information. And in response to that, they said, we're gonna hike up your bill just because of the fact that you did not, you didn't want us to share your data. That's anti-discrimination. Next slide, please. Great, yeah, thanks, Fernando. I wanna make two quick distinctions I think are maybe helpful on this slide. So uh, on disclosure and the opt-in, opt-out. So 
let's be specific. For your organization, um, if you are collecting information from California residents and they are over the age of 16, California law now, or in January 2020, uh, will be effective to say that uh, you have to give them, you have to give consumers an opt out option. And so this is a discussion and a, a sort of a distinction between well, what does opt out really mean and what does opt in really mean. And so we can use California and GDPR, um, uh, AB 375, excuse me, and GDPR as uh, good examples to show the distinctions. So again, uh, consumers in California over the age of 16 and you're collecting their information directly, you have to give that, yeah, do not sell my data or potentially the option to opt out of, again, whether it's the, the sharing or even uh, the saving of that information with certain exceptions. Uh, GDPR, on the other hand, um, it's, a, it's more complex, but essentially it's an, it's an opt-in and maybe some other options, but mostly opt-in because GDPR requires at the top level consent. Um, again, there's some, some detail there about actual defining the lawful basis for processing, and there's six of them, but consent being sort of the highest um, and I would say the, the safest harbor when it comes to collection of information. So, so yeah, what do you need to do as an organization? You need to think right now do I have California consumer information in my system? Are those people over 16? Then I need to give them an opt-out option. And how do I do that? How do I operationalize that? And secondly, uh, if I have information that I'm collecting and I believe I might have California residents that are 16, the age of 16 or less, uh, I need to understand how I can operationalize uh, an opt-in process, meaning consent. Consent is what will be required. And so again, there's more detail there and there's exceptions, but uh, that's that's a framework I think you should all be thinking about. Um, and then I'll take one question that came through. What about California nonprofits? Uh, Armanino does a lot of work with nonprofits, so um, I'm glad you asked that question. This bill is focused on for-profit entities. So uh, don't leave the webinar yet, stay with us, but this doesn't necessarily apply to your organization. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's, let's dive in just one layer deeper on the uh, right to delete or the option for a consumer to ask an organization to delete the data. It's very important, there's nine exceptions here. I've highlighted just the top five, I think, that are of interest for you. And I think, hopefully you guys can see on the slide that I've said information collected in bold from the consumer by the organization. This is one little nuance that I I actually haven't seen in some of the news coverage. Um, I think it's important to understand. So if you do not, uh, it, the right to deletion applies to organizations that again are collecting data directly from the consumer. So if I'm offering a monthly you know, software as a service product um, and asking users to sign up, I need their information to, to deliver that service to them. And if I were to get a right, uh, a request for deletion, uh, of that data, well, I would have um, an exception from that requirement um, if I needed that information to complete the transaction for which I collected that information. So if they've signed up for a year, you know, month or maybe it's month to month, you need to keep that data on file, obviously, to provide them the service and, and have identity, you know, issues, access management, things like that. Um, per perhaps to comply with a legal obligation. Um, and certainly for security purposes, I think that this is a thoughtful carve out, frankly, because a lot of the information uh, that might be collected would be to, to de detect, um, you know, threats, system incidents, potential fraud, malicious actors, things like that. There's carve outs for uh, criminal justice as well as scientific, historical, statistical research as well. All right, at risk of getting tired of hearing myself talk, the, uh, the law is going to be enforced by the Attorney General. The law provides uh, enforcement, um, or I would say gives enforcement power to the AG's office. Uh, the AG has yet to establish guidance on the law, uh, to my knowledge, and so I think we haven't really said this yet, but there is a lot yet to be determined with this bill. I think Heather mm -hmm. actually will talk about that in just a, a minute in detail. Uh, and this is one of the areas. We don't know exactly what enforcement is going to look like. Uh, we do know that the, the penalties which are enshrined in the law right now uh, are $7,500 per violation. Uh, 
And as we note here, if you take the example of you know that software as a service company having a number of records in their database, theoretically a fine uh, could be uh, levied you know per per database record, which uh, making a distinction here between GDPR again, hopefully bouncing back and forth with these distinctions is somewhat helpful. Um, GDPR has a cap on on fines for 4% of global revenue or $20 million. Well, um, that's, you know, this essentially is a no cap. If you think about the amount of data, the number of records that certain organizations hold, you can imagine that it would be well above, uh, well above that. So. All right, uh, I've already spoken to some, I think, concrete um, means of how to comply or even thinking about complying, right? Because we're so early in this stage, but these are the, uh, in this law, these are the things you need to be thinking about. Uh, data mapping and inventory is a privacy best practice. So anybody who works in privacy knows this as the study of what I have and how it moves through the organization, who has access to it, who do we share it with, um, maybe you know what information do we collect as an organization, and then how do we marry that with information we collect from other sources. So it's it's really understanding exactly what you have again and how it flows through the organization. And this is the starting point. I think that it makes sense for any organization that thinks they're subject to start this process. Also, when it comes to enforcement, um, it's a retrospective look at what you did and uh, what the organization, what measures the organization took in good faith to to comply. That's certainly the case with GDPR. As again, a note here, regulators essentially look at a couple of tiers of enforcement, but they're looking at um, what efforts were made, were there good faith efforts made to comply or to protect data by design, etc. Okay, so start there. Um, you, you have to, to uh, get your arms around a way that your organization can comply with these rights of access or rights of deletion. In the GDPR space, there's many more rights and they become complex in assessing um, the nature of the request, how to document it, how to track it, how to share it with a potentially a, a partner or a data controller or processor that you work with. Um, but in California law, you've got two of them to deal with right now, which is the deletion uh, request uh, and the access request. And so think about programmatic ways your organization can do that or manual controls to do the same. Uh, the the do not sell my personal information link um, is required for a home page. Uh, I think that's essentially going to have to be a disclaimer that maybe might be on any page that a consumer might land on in some way. I think that's yet to be determined, but uh, something to think about and how, how, again, how does the organization put a process around that? so that they can actually deal with it. And updating privacy policies. There's gonna be specific requirements for updates to your privacy policy. And I think those things are relatively straightforward, but uh, keeping an eye on what those updates look like, what impacts they're going to have on your existing privacy policy and practices internally is a good thing to start thinking about today. I think so too, uh, Noah, and also it's, uh, it's easy to recall, I think, for a lot of us, the uh, enhancements to the privacy policies and the website disclosures that we saw uh, starting May 25th or maybe even a little bit before because a lot of us got updated privacy policies in our inbox for websites that we're you know, uh, uh, logged into sometimes or have newsletters from. And you also saw banners across websites, et cetera. So you could kind of see that process um, with the GDPR requirements, they think are going to be the type of uh, processes that we see with the with the California uh, law once it enters into force. And that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about. What's next for the California bill? So, as Fernando said earlier, this bill was was pushed and promoted by Alastair McTaggart, who basically created a, a deadline by. Um, saying he was going to put it on the, the ballot in California for the voters to decide uh, what they thought uh, protection should be in place for their uh, data, their personal data. And so there was a deadline looming uh, at the end of June to remove that ballot initiative. And that's why the legislators needed to act quickly to pull something together. So this is very much viewed as a compromise bill, something that was passable in order to uh, not have it go to the you know, to the people in the fall, 
And uh, the other key component there that was important to the legislators was that if they passed a bill themselves, then they're able to make amendments to it. So the amendment process that uh, will now follow and actually has already begun is uh, pretty clearly contemplated by the people that passed the bill, that there will be uh, modifications made um, through that legislative process. So it will be interesting to see where the, where the law actually ends up when it enters into force in January 2020. Um, and in fact, uh, there were published just earlier this week, um, I think it's the first round of amendments. Um, I didn't read the amendments myself. Uh, I did read some uh, commentary on the amendments and they seem to be not, not the most uh, intense set of amendments, maybe more clarifying and organizational in nature, but I think a lot of eyes are on this process and it is expected that there will be much more to come and a lot of lobbying and attention from big tech um, as well as uh, finance companies and, and all sorts of uh, different interested parties. So that'll be very interesting to watch. And then even if uh, the bill entered into force as law in 2020 as is, which I think is pretty much impossible that that's going to be the outcome, but even if that were the case, um, as Noah pointed out, there's a lot that remains to be seen in the implementing regulations that the state's attorney general will oversee. And, and that's really where the, the devil is in the details. What does the law specifically mean for this type of company or that type of company or this industry or that, the size company, that size company, what are the enforcement provisions, uh, what is actually going to happen and, uh, you know, it, and, and, and what will that look like when it comes into force? So there's a lot that we don't know yet. I think um, recognizing that this is an evolving process uh, and strategizing, as was said earlier, on how to start to get yourself or your clients in a position where they can have a chance at uh, adhering to the law when it comes into a force is, is important. And it's also important to keep an eye on it and see uh, what continues to come out as, as the months uh, tick by and we get closer to that implementation date in January of 2020. Absolutely. There's uh, one of those initial amendments that's proposed and I think will be voted on, if not, uh, I think actually going to recess for the California legislature, so probably voted on uh, next um, next session, but is to actually extend the enforcement date to July. So we'll have an effective date, January 2020, and then enforcement wouldn't even begin until six months later. I okay. think that's a totally reasonable amendment, especially if you look at what's happened with GDPR. Uh, early on, EU data protection authorities were actually surveyed, um, and the, the majority of them said, uh, this is all well and good, but we are not even ready to enforce this. It's sweet <laughs> and we're not even ready. So I think that's going to be the case in California too. It'll take time to rev everything up, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So with that, we'll hand to Fernando and we'll kind of jump into the details of um, PII. Awesome. Thank you, Noah. So as we discuss the personal data and personal information, according to GDPR and AB 375, one of the key goals that we have is for you guys to understand um, what are the type of information that is protected under these regulations. Most of you guys are pretty much familiar already with all this information as name, social security data of birth, which is uh, applicable to some of the federal laws that we have here in the United States. I think with the advent of the California privacy law, a lot of changes, uh, a lot of additions were added which will basically, as I mentioned earlier, increase the net that's casted to what is considered as personal information. You know, next slide. So under, under personal information under California law, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, includes uh, the standard set of information that is typically covered, your social security number, your date of birth, your name, first name, last name, um, those type of information. But what makes the California law different from, from, the, from the different uh, federal laws that we had mentioned earlier is it includes other information such as devices, personal property records, your purchasing history, your internet activity, browsing, 
And it even goes to as far as getting your audio, electronic, visual, and thermal in olfactory, the similar information. <laughs> that, that is very interesting. Um, here, uh, olfactory is basically senses, right? Uh, be able to track, to identify um, the senses uh, data and be able to like um, identify the correct person that that olfactory information belongs to. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, with the advent of Internet of Things, the, there will be a lot more information that's going to be covered under this California law. For example, our cars, our cars talk to each other now. So those information are going to be classified as well as personal information under this current law. Um, your phones, um, your, your household information, uh, because again, as I mentioned earlier, this is not just personal uh, information referring to uh, an individual. If, if this California law includes households as well, we're talking about the usage of power in your household, the usage of water consumptions. And there's just a lot of uh, data that is being um, addressed and covered under this new California law. So we're really looking forward for um, the additional guidance that will be given um, by the legislature or the attorney general on the enforcement of this laws. Awesome, and we wanna see if you're paying attention still. So does the California Consumer Privacy Act go into effect in January 2019, July 2019, January 2020, or July 2020? We'll go ahead and give you guys a few seconds to answer that. Um, this is our third polling question out of four. And just as a reminder, you do need to um, answer at least three to qualify for CPE. Okay, and we're gonna go ahead and close the polls in three, two, one, and see what your answers were. There you go. All right, most people got it. Uh, everybody who thought it was January 2019, uh, you can take a deep breath. You don't have to do this over the holidays. Uh, you just gotta keep an eye on it. So, all right. Uh, so let's, uh, again, taking on big topics today, but let's, one of the underlying themes and actually one of the specific requirements of GDPR is essentially uh, data protection. And so I, I wanted to give you guys um, some context to the reason behind that. Um, and actually at, at the outset, let me note an interesting distinction uh, between GDPR and AB 375. Um, AB 375 actually says nothing about per the protection of personal data. It says nothing about what organizations must do to put walls around consumers' private information, uh, whether literal or figurative walls. Uh, and so, you know, I guess this slide maybe is more focused at GDPR and also a general understanding of what are we, what are the threats to personal data? Where do they come from? I think they fall into three big buckets, your internal, your external, and your third-party threats, third-party service provider threats. And you know, GDPR's purpose uh, isn't so much, um, well, it's protection of personal data, but the threats that it's really driving at are um, the internal and the external that we all would imagine, but also organizations' misuse, uh, unlawful collection of data, lack of proper notice and consent uh, when collecting data, essentially improper use, whether that's sharing or internal improper use, exceeding a user's consent, for instance, if there was a consent mechanism in place, but that data is actually used for purposes uh, beyond that consent, um, imper impermissible sharing or sale, um, potentially unlawful sale in certain cases, and then excessive retention, lack of data quality measures. Uh, GDPR has many requirements that speak specifically to uh, to this by data protection by design, um, the requirement for inventory and data protection impact assessments, et cetera. So continuing in this theme, uh, I wanted to just give a quick overview of privacy or data protection, I guess, best practices. Uh, this is uh, 
um, a very distilled version, but here again, I think it basically encompasses the universe of things you would want to know or things you would want to think about in your organization when you're talking about data protection. Um, and you know, specific to privacy, collect only what you need. I think we're in the we're in the world of big data where more information is seen as more powerful or potentially more insights can be gained. Uh, as the pendulum swings back towards um, you know, consumers' privacy rights and, um, and you know, inevitably, I think that that will, that will be rolled back a little bit. Organizations will say, okay, wow, uh, especially in the US, what do we actually need to connect to get these insights? Do we need to collect all location data, for instance? Uh, GPS data, et cetera, or is that presenting an undue risk to the organization? So collect what you need. Uh, don't retain it longer than necessary. Um, the cost of storage has gone down drastically year over year, and that has, has essentially been a one-for-one -one increase with how much data has been retained. So organizations are storing vast amounts of data, um, and from personal experience, I can tell you that uh, often longer than than necessary. It's kind of a retain all as everybody's default. So think about that. Encrypt data. Uh, encryption of data is actually getting uh, less and less expensive and less technical per day, I would say. Um, many of the systems you all may use, third-party applications, uh, cloud applications, may already have data encryption at rest and in transit. Um, but if you're using legacy systems, think about what you need to do to, again, put some walls around that data encrypt it. Uh, back up early and often, always a best practice. Apply principles of least privilege, uh, logical, I guess, and physical access here. Um, you know, this is internal best practices and controls around logical access. Uh, and then, as discussed earlier, you want to classify and inventory your data, and you probably want to revisit that process periodically. So you want to continue to assess what are you collecting and why, how is it flowing throughout the organization, how is it flowing out of the organization, et cetera. And as a best practice um, and working <laughs> within the audit field, I would recommend that you audit these, these practices generally. Um, depending on the size and complexity of your organization, uh, that audit can take different forms, of course. So I will say now that time check, we're running up against time. Hopefully everybody's not too glassy-eyed, but we do appreciate um, the attention thus far. And we're going to jump into the last polling question, and I think then we'll probably have to leave the rest of the content in the appendix for you all. We hope that that's a helpful reference for specifics on GDPR. If you tr if you assess that, if you look at that appendix, you're looking at uh, basically everything that you need to know at a high level for GDPR. And the last polling question is the California Consumer Protection Act of 2018 requires A, data protection by design, B, information security policies and procedures, C, a data protection officer, or D, all of, or none of the above. So we'll go ahead and give you guys a few seconds for that. Okay, and then we're going to go ahead and close the polls in three, two, one. All right, this was the trickiest of my questions. 19% of the people, I would say, got it right. Those that answered B, I think you're on the right track in terms of thinking your organization certainly should have treatment of information security by policy and by procedure. Um, however, it's not really named in the law, and it's not something... Um, I pulled these as trick questions from GDPR. So these are things that are required by GDPR and the data protection officer is required for certain organizations depending on factors. So um, with just a couple of minutes left, I don't think we have any questions outstanding to answer. So I'll just take the opportunity to thank you all um, again for joining and based on the polling questions, it looked like people were paying attention. Um, use us as a resource. Um, please feel free to reach out personally. Uh, we'd be more than happy to you know, get into a conversation about your organization, what you should be thinking about, and we'd love to stay in contact um, over the next you know, few months and year as the changes come into effect, as the amendments are made, um, and help you and your organization succeed uh, and stay away from the penalties. So thank you, everybody, for joining.